morning, everyone, and welcome to worship this Pentecost Sunday. We are gathering online again at Mitchellville, uh, as Mitchellville Christian Church. We are still not meeting in our building uh, out of concern for the safety and the health of each and every one of our members, especially those who are most vulnerable um, to the illness that is going around still right now. Um, so I, I welcome you. I see that a lot of you have put on some red or something uh, pretty close to that color to help us celebrate the day of Pentecost. Um, and that is always exciting to see that somebody got your, got your message. <laughs> so uh, with that, I will go ahead and ask um, our worship leader to lead us in announcements. Does uh, anyone have any announcements for the week? If so, you can go ahead and, and unmute yourself and, and join in. Um, I will say that there is the, the committee looking at when we are going to be going back to, to church and what that might look like. I don't know if Gray is handy and if he wants to say anything about that or Rachel, uh, otherwise it's Gray and Amanda Wabshall and myself that are on the committee. Um. Jeff, if you'd like to say a little bit about that, that's that would be okay with me. Sure. I guess the the two things that the congregation needs to know about is is we're looking together of uh, looking. Wow, I can't talk this morning either. We're looking at putting together. There we go. A survey to send out to everyone uh, just to kind of get your thoughts. Uh, we will have some sort of report put together for the board meeting next week. So other than that, I don't know if I want to really share too much because we're still a lot of things are still in kind of the the planning putting together stage until we can put together our report for the board. But if anyone does have anything they would like us to know or to consider, you can contact uh, Ray or Amanda and I, and, and we'll make sure we make it part of the report. One there. other announcement um, I shared with the elders this morning, I'll share with you all, um, and we'll send out an email as well. But our church was asked to um, participate in a um, in an act of commemoration for the lives that have been lost um, for, during COVID-19 uh, for during in Iowa in the month of May. So we're going to be participating in that day of mourning. That will be tomorrow, the first Monday of the month of June uh, at noon, and it will involve some ringing of the church bell. Um, I say that to those of you who live in Mitchellville. Um, I heard the bell for the first time this past week, and it's very loud. Um, so it will be, it will be a, a bit disruptive, but that's, that's part of, I think, not so much the point to be disruptive, but to honor those lives, we are going to be ringing um, that bell as a, as a sign of mourning, as a sign of um, just recognizing that this has really taken uh, very much a toll on the lives of many uh, here in our own state. So if anyone um, is wondering what that is tomorrow, that, that is what it is. Anyone who would like to uh, help participate, I do invite you to come. Um, I'll have some signage up at the church as well. Um, if you'd like to come participate, I ask that you wear a mask and I'll have some hand sanitizer and you can ring the bell a few times if you'd like. So. And what time will that start? Noon. Casey, did you have, did you raise your hand? Yep. So um, this Sunday is Pentecost Sunday and normally we have um, our offering for Pentecost. This year, because of COVID, we were not able to have those envelopes handy. So later on today, I will send out a link if you would like to um, give an offering to the Disciples Missions Fund for the Pentecost offering. They will be taking that this Sunday and next Sunday. Um, they raise money to start new churches. So that's what the Pentecost offering goes to. So I will send out more information on that later today, but I just wanted to lift that up during announcements. Okay, any other announcements? Okay, if not, uh, We'll give it a minute for me to get everyone unmuted and Casey to get the call to worship slide up. And would you join me in the this morning's call to worship? 
The Lord said, you, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. As Paul spoke these words to Timothy, we remember that God did not give us a spirit of fear. But rather a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Grant us, O God, that same spirit. We can win us your gift, gift, so that we may may worship gladly, gladly, love love sincerely, sincerely, and be your witnesses witnesses to the the end of of this broken and and hurting world. world. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in the, the opening hymn? In Christ there is no east or west. join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us this day as you were with the disciples of old. They had just lost Jesus and he had ascended to heaven and I'm sure they were wondering what was coming next in their lives. The person that was dearest to them had been taken away from them and and now I'm sure there was a hole that they just were not sure how it was going to be filled. But yet it was your plan to fill them with the Holy Spirit, fill them beyond probably how their hearts had ever been filled with before. And that came spilling out of them that day that we now call Pentecost. As we are separated from each other and there is strife in this part of the country and all over the country, it seems like both due to COVID-19 and and just the way people are reacting to how each other Uh, Just let us also be filled with that Holy Spirit and just give people grace and peace and let us learn how to live with each other even when we disagree with each other. As we take these things and take them into our heart, just let us remember the prayer that your son taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done, be done on, earth on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread. bread. Forgive, forgive, forgive us our debts, our debts as we as forgive our debtors. Our debtors. Our and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is thy kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And it is youth time. Boys. And you can probably hear Gray going to get our kids. <laughs> oh no, he hopes it includes candy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I eat them? No, not right now. Do you guys want to say hello? Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right, stand up, please. So, today, do you notice anything about all these people here? Anything that they might have in common? 
maybe in their clothes. Or on their clothes. Or on their clothes, yeah. They're all red. Yeah, a lot of people are wearing red, huh? You're wearing red. I think that was kind of a fluke, but there it is. And you're wearing and red. And I'm wearing red, yeah. And, and I'm not really wearing red. Do you know no, what? I'm wearing red. <laughs> Look at me. It's Valentine's Day. Remember. It's the only thing it means. That's the only thing it means is that it could be Valentine's Day? Mm -hmm. So we're actually celebrating. You're right that we're celebrating something. But there's another holiday that we all wear red for in the church, and it's called the Day of Pentecost. Do you know what that? Have you heard of that before? I love your shirt. I'm, I'm glad you love my shirt. My shirt has sparkles on it. You probably can't see this from there. All right. Mm -hmm. Do you know, have you heard of Pentecost? Have I talked no. to you about that yet? No? Do you remember, there's a painting around here that I painted the other night for art night, and it has, and it has little, like it has an outline of people, right? And then these little tongues of fire. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. So Pentecost is the day that we remember fire. that kind of fire, but we remember the day that the Holy Spirit of God came to the people that were gathered in the room. And when the Holy Spirit came down, it was like tongues of fire sat on top of their heads but like didn't burn them up. I know that's kind of scary, right? Didn't burn them up, but sat on top of their heads. The other thing though, in that story that tells us that the Holy Spirit was there is that there was a huge rush of wind. Yeah. Wait, So, mm -hmm. were, was the fire still on it on them or did it just blow off? First there was the wind and then there was the fire, but that's a good question. It, the order probably matters. So I wanted to ask you guys if you've ever seen the wind. No. No? You sure? Do you know what the wind is? No. No? Wind. It's wind. It's wind, yeah. Wind you, know, wind. you know what I mean when I say the word wind. What does wind do? Um, it blows stuff. It blows stuff, blows stuff around. How do you see wind when it happens? Like nothing. Um, um, you can see wind when it shakes the leaves. When it shakes the leaves, exactly. Mm -hmm. So like, if I use my breath to make wind, and I blow on this paper, watch. Did you see my breath? Yeah. Did no. you see the wind? No. No? I did see sure? it. There, it's right there. But you know that there is wind, right? And you know because the paper's moving? Right? Or some other reason? All right. It was getting in. <laughs> so, here, can you guys come stand over here? Right there. Um, Mom, right there. Maybe you should take that off. Maybe, yeah. There's a little something on the floor. He said, no, maybe you should pick that up. So we can't see the wind. Like it doesn't have a shape or a color or anything like that, but we can see what it does, right? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. <laughs> yes. The same is true. The same is true of the Holy Spirit. The same is true of the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit came to all those people and it came like a rush of mighty wind and like the tongues of fire, stop eating my bread. <laughs> it wasn't something really that people could see, but it gave, it gave the people there a spirit of power and of love that came from God. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, that is the part of God <laughs> that lives inside of each and every one of us, right? We've talked about that, how there's a, a part of God that lives inside us, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the Holy Spirit that lives inside us, and we can't see it, but we do know when it's working. Because when it's working, that is when we are moved to do the things that the Holy Spirit would want us to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Well, then after we can have the bread. No, that's my mm -hmm. communion bread.
I love you, God. Holy Spirit. You guys want to say with me? Dear God. Dear God, Holy Spirit, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for the wind. Thank you for your presence. Even when we can't see it, we can feel it. Thank you for all the ways that you show yourself to us. Thank you for the time that we get to be together, even when we're not all together in the same room. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> Today's scripture reading comes in two parts. The first is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. It is entitled, The Coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the, cr the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native tongues of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthian, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. Our second reading comes from Timothy, chapter 2, verses, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recall in your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind, for this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you throughout the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Again, it is, as we've mentioned plenty of times already this morning, it is Pentecost Sunday. And I have to tell you that I imagined today going a lot differently. Um, in my, some of you already know I'm not much of a planner as far as planning ahead, um, but I had looked forward to this day and I had planned for it to look very much different. In the scripture today from Acts, the very first sentence, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. All together. And I sure miss that. Early last month when people were optimistically uh, hoping for a very large Easter service, on Sunday, I set my heart on Pentecost. And I thought that even thinking ahead to Pentecost would be too conservative of a date. It would be too far out there. People would not want to wait that long. And it, but it felt practical and it felt safe. And for a preacher, it felt like it could be a lot of fun. 
when I was probably about a week before Easter, when I knew that we would not be meeting in person for that service, that very important uh, day in our church, I spent some time in the sanctuary and I stood not from behind the pulpit, but in the center of the aisle, right in front of the communion table. And I practiced preaching to a room full of people. I stood in front of the empty sanctuary and I preached to empty pews and I walked up and down the aisles pretending and practicing looking each and every person in the eye and greeting each person by name. And I was so looking forward to being able to do that with everyone in our sanctuary. And I imagined my emotions getting the best of me and I practiced trying to keep my voice steady in spite of my nerves. And I imagined that I could recite this first verse from the second book of Acts and say it with joy and celebration and repeating it as the spirit moved. They were all together in one place and people would smile and people would feel like, yeah, that's what we're doing right now, all together in one place. And then I would say it again, and depending on how my voice carried, I might get even some amens, even though I know that is not our tradition. But as I said, they were all together in one place. They were all together in one place. I might get some reaction. Because how amazing would that have been to be all together in one place today? But as time went on, it didn't take long after that imagined and hopeful sermon to empty pews before learning that being all together, coming back to church is not going to happen quickly and it's not going to look that way that I imagined it. As the special committee that is tasked with the matters of reopening as they continue to meet, and as I chat weekly with other pastors and church leaders and churchgoers from our own congregation and from all, all over the Midwest, I'm gradually discouraged by how different our reunion will actually be and how far away as well. I imagined the celebration, this crowd of people, to be just like those disciples and those faithful Jews from all over gathering in that room to be together. But there is not a large gathering today. We are not all in the same room because we are in a different world. I saw a potluck and I saw gifts and I saw hugs and I saw handshakes, but that isn't happening because that's not the world we're in. We are in a different world. And then as I prepared this sermon for this Sunday, knowing that we are going to be meeting this way online, I imagined preaching about the spirit that we've been given, not one of fear, but instead one of love and power and self-discipline. And I imagined preaching to how that spirit is the same one that moves us to be self-disciplined and to stay in our homes, to not meet in person for worship out of the love and the power that we have to care for one another. Because that felt like the most important message that I could take from this Pentecost text. But Again, we are not exactly in that world. There is a more pressing and more important message for today. And as I thought about this, I realized that the world that we live in and the world that the, those disciples on the first Pentecost lived in, perhaps they are not so different. The setting for that story describes people coming from all over, speaking different languages, unable to under understand one another, even though they possibly spoke a common language that they would use in their religious 
rituals. But they are separated and they are separated by their language, by misunderstanding. And perhaps our world is not so different. There are things that divide us and divisions that keep the people of our world from understanding one another. And those divisions are as many as there are languages to describe them. The spirit that came to those gathered in the upper room was an empowering spirit. And the spirit of God didn't come to empower the followers of Jesus with fear-mongering words. And it didn't come to rest above the heads of those gathered to whisper words of deceit. The spirit came to each and every person in that room so that they might be understood. And the miracle that happened on that day wasn't the gift of speaking in tongues that weren't yet familiar to them, but rather it was the gift of understanding one another, of finding commonality, of undoing the division that started at the Tower of Babel so that the present, so that all present may be as one in a spirit of understanding, so that none may leave that place having heard the good news of Jesus Christ and still be unaware of its meaning. And that spirit seems to be lost on us in present day. And when I think back, look back over the course of church history from that first day of Pentecost, which is considered to be the birthday of the church, it's why our Pentecost offering goes towards new churches, that is, the starting place of the Christian church. But even since that very day, there have been few occurrences of the Spirit filling a group of people in such a way as that first night in the upper room. I don't think that it can be said truthfully that Christians or any other group of human beings joined together by religion or nationality or humanity have really ever been of the same mind and understanding since that day. And perhaps the expectations that our words are understood as we intend to present them is the cause of much of that misunderstanding. In America and in the world today, we know quite unfortunately that a common language is not nearly enough on its own to create unity among a people or many groups of people. And we see this everywhere particularly on social media, but that is not the only place. And it certainly was not the beginning. We tend to hold each other to a standard of understanding that can't actually exist without the help of the spirit that lives within each of us. We expect a, a standard of understanding that can't exist in the comment section of a social media post where the spirit is rarely invited to be present and where we do not listen to understand, but rather to reply. We expect a standard of understanding that doesn't exist when we isolate the news and opinions that we read so that they confirm our own opinions and assumptions. We gather facts that support what we already believed and we assume far too often that it is common sense. We assume far too often that any sane, rational person will know or believe or understand as we do, because we believe ourselves to be sane, rational, faithful persons. But despite our language, despite our attempts to explain ourselves, we can still be misunderstood and we are still in a world that is torn apart by nationalism, a world that is torn apart by political power and unrest, we are in a world torn apart by greed and injustice, by racism and inequality, by prejudice, by hunger, by hate, by fear. And if you don't believe me, maybe you've had the good privilege to be able to turn off the news this past week 
or the past month or the past year or any time that there is some uneasiness in our world that turns violent against our neighbor, sparked by the sin of racism and of arrogance and of love of power. And I want to be clear because I know that this is a point of anxiety for a lot of us right now, it feels very close to home because there are riots in Des Moines as there are in Minneapolis and other big cities all over the country. But the sin that I am talking about is the sin of murder that has been committed against black bodies and brown bodies, committed by white bodies that are fueled by the sin of racism, whether that is well disguised or proudly flaunted or flat out denied. Lovely people, what I am about to say, I don't say lightly, and I don't say it to disregard the goodness and the love within each of you for your neighbor. I've spent enough time in conversation and enough time in your presence to know that each and every one of you has a good and kind heart, a kind soul and a love for Jesus and a love for each other that you live out in your daily lives, even when no one is looking. But I have to tell you that this is not only a sin that, I'm sorry, that it is not only a sin to commit a racist murder. But it is a sin to flat out deny that each and every one of us is afflicted by racist thoughts. Each and every one of us is responsible for involuntary racist action or voluntary inaction against racism. And it's common in our assumed kindness to proclaim that we don't see color as if to say that we are blind to the difference in another person's skin, and therefore we treat everyone the same. And these words are well-intentioned. I believe that to be absolutely true. And I know that I've said them and I've received them as the most loving way to be against race-based violence and bigotry. But the truth is, friends, that we are not and cannot be blind to the color of another person's skin. To be so, we would have to be physically blind. But in a world where racism has dug its roots down so deep into our history and our systems, I believe that even a physically blind person could be taught to know the color of someone's skin and therefore how to treat them based on the sound of their voice. So to be truly colorblind, one would have to be both blind and deaf. But even Helen Keller, who is famously known for her physical blindness and physical deafness, knew what was expected to maintain the racial hierarchies so prevalent in the South during her time. My point to that end, friends, is that it's not possible to be truly blind to skin color. And that's important. It's important to acknowledge, it's important to own. Because if we cannot be truly blind, then to say we don't see, see color is to be willfully blind to the way that we and our neighbors, our siblings, our sisters and brothers are affected by it. And as a congregation of all white folks in a town that is overwhelmingly white and a state that is predominantly white, it can be so easy to turn a blind eye to racial injustice in the world. It can be so easy to see what is happening in Des Moines as, as something that is irrational, something that is overzealous, something that doesn't, didn't have a start and is not the right way to respond. It can be so easy to turn off the television and put down the newspaper and the social media posts and think, that's sad, but that's not my problem. And it's even easier and more dangerous still to keep an eye on these events and say to oneself, 
that would never be me because I don't see color. Friends, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we all see color and what we refuse to see when we say that is that what we refuse to see is the fear of talking about it and the deeply ingrained prejudice that goes left unchecked and guides every action and reaction from the subtle to the tragic to the heinous that we have towards our black and brown neighbors. And that sin that is racism on a societal level, when it continues to go unchecked and it continues to be denied by otherwise good, loving people, that sin affects the lives of countless of our neighbors and siblings of color on a day-to-day -day basis. If you have been brave enough to keep listening, beyond the noise of those who would like to try and politicize the violence, the grief and the anger. You may just hear the stories being shared by friends and neighbors whose black or brown skin has made them more visible and more vulnerable to violence, to grief, and to anger. You may just hear stories of the daily heavy anxieties that press down and oppress people of color in our country in ways that you and I never ever have to think about. I know that it isn't exactly polite to describe white privilege so directly from the pulpit. It messes with our sensibilities and it makes us uncomfortable and it smacks of political leanings that pastors tend to avoid at all costs. And there's a legitimate fear that haunts most of us, not only pastors, but <clears throat> our congregations and our families and our friends when we talk about racial inequality and racism, we fear the retort, we fear the reaction, we fear the backlash. As if anything we're saying out loud in the name of Jesus Christ's call to love our neighbor does not come with some risk. But here's what I've learned in my reading and my studying of scripture this week. God did not give us a spirit of fear. When the spirit descended upon those gathered in the upper room and they began speaking and understanding one another as if in their own language, they got funny looks. They got a reaction. The people looking on believed them to be drunk on new wine at nine in the morning, crazy, ridiculous, overzealous, too loud. But the same spirit that gave them the gift of understanding gave them the power to speak up and to respond boldly and loudly for all to hear. Paul writes <clears throat> in his letter to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which I saw in your mother and in your grandmother and now in you. And I urge you to rekindle the gifts of the spirit, knowing that you have not been given by God a spirit of fear, but you have been given, we, have been given a spirit of power. We have been given a spirit of love. We have been given a spirit of self-control. The power of the Holy Spirit emboldens us to speak. The love of the Holy Spirit tells us what to say. The self-control of the Holy Spirit tells us when to say it. Friends, if you have ever doubted whether or not to say something, whether it is about this, the, the racist acts happening all over our country again and again, this is not a new occurrence. And your friends, and your neighbors of color will be able to tell you that this is not one event that people are reacting to. It is a lifetime. It is countless generations that people are reacting to right now. And the worst thing that we can do 
is to pretend that it isn't happening and to pretend that we don't have any part in it at all. And it is not enough to say that we don't see color. It is not enough to say that we are not ourselves racist. Instead, we must take on that spirit, power and love and self-control and work towards becoming anti-racist. Because that is the way that we move forward. That is the way that we create a world on, on earth as it is in heaven where every single person is actually created and treated equally. Again, God did not give us a spirit of fear. And I know that fear that comes up as a white person speaking to a bunch of white people and uh, even having a social media presence where every, almost every person there is another white person. We don't like to make each other uncomfortable. That is something that our brothers and our sisters of color do not actually get to choose. And so in the spirit of loving our neighbor, in the spirit of love and of power and of self-control that we have been given by God, let us be emboldened to speak when it matters, to shut down any to not be afraid at Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving lunch, to not be afraid to say something when racist jokes and things that we would normally brush aside when they come up. That is one way, one very small way that we can do something, that we can say something, and it is a thing we avoid out of fear all the time. My dear fellow white people, this, we were not given a spirit of fear. So I encourage you, as you are in the world, whether online or out and about this week, as things are opening up, please continue to stay safe. Please also continue to love one another and to speak up when it's important, and to speak out when it is needed, and trust that the Holy Spirit has given you that power and has given you that love to do so. May it be so. We go forward now in a spirit of prayer. Um, or this is the part of the service. In the past, we have been pausing the recording to share uh, joys and concerns. We have changed that a little bit. You will see that it is still recording, but in the 
post-production, if you will, um, this section is being taken out before it is uh, shared on YouTube publicly. So I invite you now, if you have joys or concerns that you would like to share with each other, uh, you can unmute yourself, wave a hand, or however you would like to share. I want to lift up the, um, the folks still at the care center, uh, the staff and the residents. I haven't heard new news. Um, I know that they are wanting, as, as most of us are, to get things back to normal and that, um, as with most things, that requires quite a bit of planning and, and certain steps that need to uh, take place. But um, for them and for people in care centers and nursing homes all over, the people who are caring for them. Is there any other joys or concerns before we go to God in prayer? Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we give thanks once more for this way that we are able to come together, to be in one place, even as we are not able to be in one room. We give you thanks that the church has never been the building, but rather the people who meet there. And wherever we meet, in whatever way, we know that you and your spirit are here with us. For that, we give thanks and we give praise. Father, there are so many things heavy on our hearts right now. There are people hurting in our community, people hurting in our country, people hurting in our world. And God, we don't have to tell you what those things are. Some of them are new, only in name. But God, we know that there is nothing that is new to you. We know too that your people, your church has made it through things like plagues before. God, we know that this virus as it tolls on is not going to have the last word. God, we pray for a swift cure. We pray for your guidance and your wisdom to be with those who are working so hard to find it and to create a vaccine for it so that we may be around each other and not be a risk to one another. And God, we also know that the things that we are seeing on television and the way that people are responding None of this is new either. And we lament that the violence that has been committed against black and brown bodies in our country, we lament that, this is, that it is not new and we lament that it is not over. And God, as I was reminded today in our elders meeting, Please help us, help us, God, to have our eyes and our ears attuned to those who are hurting the most right now, the families and the friends and the communities of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, for all of those whose names have become hashtags for all of those whose parents and spouses and children and friends are grieving their loss and seeing it spread all over the news. God, we ask your comfort for them. And we know that our prayers are not enough and we know that it is our responsibility on some level to bring about the change that needs to happen in the world. And God, we ask 
for your spirit to meet us here and to give us, fill us, rekindle within us that power and that love and that self-control. Remind us again that we are not to be afraid. God, for all those who are hurting for things not related to this virus, not related to current events, God, we pray for your comfort. We pray for your healing for the sick. We pray for those who are caring for the sick, those who are on the front lines, those who are risking their lives, risking their health, risking their mental health every single day for a variety of reasons. And all of those who we have named and all of those who we name in our hearts, we lift them up to you, God, and we commend them to you. We ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. to the table, wherever we are, to remember communion and to participate in that meal in which we do every week. I invite you to gather the things that you uh, prepared at the beginning of the service. I have some bread and some water today. One of the hymn that we just sang, One Bread, One Body, reminds me of 
something uh, that I have read from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I can't, I can't quote it back to you uh, exactly. And if I try, I'm just gonna sit here uh, in quiet for a bit. But the thing that he said was essentially that we are all woven together. We are all unable to be separated from one another. And some, whatever direct, I'm sorry, whatever affects one of us directly affects all of us indirectly. And that holds a special meaning right now for us. And we, when we come to this table, we remember not only the sacrifice that Jesus made out of his love for us, but we remember also that we are connected. We are connected as Christians and we are connected as human beings. We gather around our own tables to symbolize the table in our sanctuary that we gather around, which symbolizes the larger table that Christians everywhere gather around as often as they do in remembrance of the one who taught us to love one another. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I pray that we can get to know our neighbors, even though we may have known them our whole lives, or we may barely know them at all. Um, I pray that we may take this, this time of social distancing, and we may get to know our neighbors a little bit better. We may seek to understand a little bit more in this time of confusion and misunderstanding. Um, I pray that no matter your position, race, um, wherever you may be in life, I pray that our leaders and community members are staying safe in this time and we as a congregation of Christians can do whatever we can to be a leader in that. Gracious God, be with us during this time of our service where we come together, coming together not in person but virtually as we take and we remember your sacrifice as we take the time of reflection may we also have a moment where we remember the lives taken unjustly lives taken from us from illness may we pray for our state and our country and now as we take this communion may it give us peace with your promise may we feel your presence and your spirit may the language that we speak as christians be of justice, of understanding, and of love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. It was on the night of Jesus' betrayal as he gathered with his disciples. He broke the bread with his disciples and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
We've come to the time in our service where after having been filled, we give back and we give of our gifts of time, of talent or of treasure, whether you're giving money or whether you're thinking about how you, your gifts can be used for the church or for the world. I invite you to prayerfully consider how it is that God is calling you and that the spirit is moving within you to use those gifts for bringing about his kingdom here on earth. I invite you, uh, if you are wanting to give to the special offering, um, when you mail in your check, please make a, a note of that. Um, the, I believe, is it just the Pentecost offering? offering? That, yeah, and that goes to support um, the not only the building, but also the, fi the financial um, needs of new congregations. I believe that fund helps to fund those congregations for the first three years until they can become um, sufficient on their own. Um, so that is an incredible ministry, and I invite you to give and to give generously. Um, and the ways that you can do that are on the screen. You can mail in a check, you can give online, or use the Givelify app um, to do those things. And now uh, we will say a prayer over the gifts that are received today or those that you are considering using in the future. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, we give praise and joy over these offerings. We are grateful for these gifts and the great works of our church. Thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now, as we prepare to go, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his spirit, the spirit of power and of love and of self-control, fill you this day and as you go forward into your week. As we prepare to go, let us lift our hands as if joining together so we can sing our sending hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for um, just being present during, I know this is a bit of a difficult time. Uh, so I apologize for, well, I don't apologize, but thank you for being here for a somber service on a day uh, that we normally would be celebrating quite a bit. And if you would like to, you can turn your mics off and say hello and uh, chat with one another.